Welcome again this Thursday morning for this uh, fourth uh, installation this week as we continue to handle the book of James. I want to believe that you're getting blessed and I want to believe that God is speaking and ministering to us in a powerful way. Yesterday we were asking and uh, prosecuting the concept of asking God for wisdom and uh, we realized that trials reveal our need for divine guidance and strength. Trials reveal our need for divine guidance and strength. Let's just pray before we continue. Father, we thank you for once again giving us the opportunity to handle the book of James, release the kind of grace for wisdom and revelation to the glory and honor of your name. We ask in humility, dear Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, we established that the purpose of trials, persecutions, and, uh, and, and the various temptations that we go through and adversity is actually meant to help uh, us to produce the fruit of the Spirit and become a formidable believer. And trials reveal our need for divine guidance and strength. That is, we trust that God will hear and provide because every good and perfect gift comes from above. We are going to be handling that in the course of our discussion. But as you ask God for wisdom, do not doubt. Do not doubt. Because this doubt is what you would call the duplic duplicious. It's like um, having a split, splitness in this, if I can use that word. You are very, you're, you're split and scattered. This being split and scattered causes you to be unstable. It causes you to be unstable. But then in our discussion also, when we pray, we must ask in faith because it is an insult to God to ask anything at the same time you doubt. It is an insult to God when you're asking something from God and at the same time you're doubtful, you know. Faith and doubt are um, two in two things that are opposed to each other, if I can use that word. Faith and unbelief, you know, they, they are not twins in any way, you know. Doubt destabilizes the soul like the winds of the sea. Doubt destabilizes the soul like the wind of the sea because doubt is uh, like, you become like a two-souled individual too soul and you will receive nothing from God. Today we want to deal with verse 9 of chapter 1 to 11. Verse 9 to 11. I believe you have read in advance because I would propose that at least you read in advance so that we are um, uh, ahead of what we are discussing and we are familiar with the content. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flowers fall and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. This descri description, like I said again yesterday, the truth is descriptive in nature, but also the truth is prescriptive. It describes a scenario, but prescribes a solution or a way out. So if the scenario is not pleasant, then the prescription is a way out of that unpleasantness. Trials clarify what is valuable in life. Trials clarify what is valuable in life. One of life's greatest acquisition in life that at least this uh, one, two, three verses describe is that it is bringing in the importance of humility in our journey of acquisitions. 
the concept of humility. Remember the what we discussed up there is that we should count it all joy when you are going through diverse temptations and trials, knowing that this particular testing of your faith produces patience, all right? And patience works faith. We established that. But then also in verse 5, we picked another concept. So there is the joy in trials and temptation. Then there is the wisdom in trials and temptations. And then there is now the third concept that we are discussing today, humility in trials and temptations. Humility in trials and temptations. This is going to be a blessing to us today. It's a very interesting discourse. Learning the value from the value of humility. Learning from the value of humility. In my notes, there's something that I want to introduce to us about the importance of humility. Generally, humility, if not checked very well, you can learn it from humiliation. <laughs> the Bible says this, humble yourself before God that he may lift you. So there is the twofold aspect of it. The choice that we need to make to humble ourselves a decision we have to make to humble ourselves. But then realize this, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He opposes the proud but he also gives grace to the humble. So if you choose to walk the path of humility, there is grace given to you by God. If you choose to walk the path of pride, there is the now opposition from God. Sometimes... You know, being a pastor can be very interesting uh, engagement because sometimes you want to pray for people that they may prosper. You want to pray for people that God will lift them and change their life situation. But then in the process of praying for some people and the congregation at large, God can by his own grace through his uh, spiritual technology enables you to see that the reason why this person won't prosper is because that person is proud. And there is no amount of anointing that can break the curse in that individual because it is God opposing that person because of pride. So there is no man of God who is so seriously anointed to break and eliminate what God is opposing. It's only the humility in that person and that is why now from our end, we pray and plead for mercy. <laughs> we pray and plead for mercy. In the process now, this re recipient that you are praying for may not think that you have prayed the right prayer. Yet you have pleaded for God's mercy upon that individual that perhaps through that mercy, this person's eyes will be opened that they may now choose the path of humility. Sometimes if they don't voluntarily choose that path, then now humiliation becomes the technology being used to open the eyes of this individual. Don't forget that Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. Not because he was proud, but there is, that, <laughs> there is a certain obedience that can come to man through the things they suffer. So in other words, you can't eliminate the importance of suffering in the life of a believer. Because obedience can be learned through what they suffer. Okay, let's flip it on this other side and use the concept of honor. For example, chapter 6 of Ephesians. Uh, children, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you. So sometimes you can see someone's life not going very well. And there is no again anointing that can break that thing. Because God can show you something and tell you, you know, this guy is a victim of dishonor. A victim of dishonor. There are people who dishonor their own parents, biological. They dishonor the men of God. This one is worse. Don't forget that the men of God are grace carriers. I know we don't like that language. Again, the abuse of this particular concept does not invalidate the principle from functioning. <laughs> Your parents, 
might in in all honesty desire deserving to be dishonored because of their behavior because of their words because of what they do and i'm not diminishing that uh, experience from being a reality in your life i'm not diminishing it but then it does not also qualify your dishonor on them it will not go well with you and there is no amount of prayer that can be done to eliminate that thing from impacting on you negatively there is none Dishonor is dishonor regardless of who does it and regardless of it's a principle just the way disobedience is disobedience regardless regardless and so now the concept of humility now is being introduced here by James to be an aid that in the face of trials and temptations all these things are like a litmus experience it clarifies what is valuable in life The poor or lowly man may be thankful that his station in life has taught him a degree of humility and in Christ he has been exalted and seated with the Lord. But then the rich also and the powerful is humbled in Christ in that his social status is of no advantage to the spiritual realm. <laughs> This is a very deep concept that I wish every believer can learn this at their elementary stages of their spiritual walk with God. Because to the poor being seated with Christ can teach them humility. But then also to the rich when they discover that their wealth is not of any spiritual advantage to them it's not of any spiritual advantage especially in the spiritual realm i mean the wealth that god has brought to the life of any believer is meant to be a tool that aids the purposes of god to be of more advantage to many if we don't attach our pursuit of wealth to the purpose of god if we don't attach our pursuit of wealth to the purpose and the agenda of god 100% destruction is imminent it's just a matter of time not unless the mercies of god reaches out in advance or the prevailing prayer in the atmosphere that has been saturated by this spiritual capital that can now bring this brokenness to these individuals otherwise pride is a sure deliverer of destruction because it comes before so any time there is a manifestation of pride then the end goal is visible it will end in a fall the rich and the powerful is humbled in Christ in that his social status is of no advantage in the spiritual realm he should rejoice in his new perspective of life seeing that the power and riches are soon going to pass away we read that this i mean the riches and this power will soon pass away if we can use an analogy in kenyan uh, politics in different dispensations in our political uh, world we have seen men and women who have been very powerful extremely powerful just the mentions of their name it actually spells thunder when you hear their names you know this guy is no joke but then with the changing regimes we realize that this person was not actually powerful they were just close to power when you are close to power it does not in any way imply assimilation <laughs> when you are close proximity to power does not in any way imply assimilation you are not you are not the one who is powerful but then also if we understand this as a believer that we are not the ones who are powerful it is the greater in us who is powerful then our pursuit of this particular concept now makes sense whereby you pursue god more because now he becomes the greater who is in you than who is in the world matthew chapter 6 verse 20 
allow me to go there very quickly so that we give this uh, thought line uh, a fixture of some, some, some relevance. It says this in verse 20. Let me pick it from verse 19. Do not lay, lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The concept of humility is also attached to what we have placed as of value. So if we treasure our wealth, our heart will be in the wealth. But if we treasure the giver of this wealth, our hearts will be sold out to the giver. Humility in this sense now becomes a key concept when we are dealing with trials and temptation. Because if we respond in humility, then we get empowered to handle this adversity, the opposition. We handle the pressure that comes with these trials and temptation. Very important that God gives grace to the humble. Is it chapter 4, verse 16? Let me rush right there, right there. It says, but now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Dangerous to boast. First Peter chapter number 5, verse number 5. Allow me to go there. First Peter chapter number 5, verse number 5, so that I give this to... Um, I mean a proper perspective because for one to build a, a stronger case uh, doctrinally at least you have to read uh, not read cross-reference several scriptures for it to make sense likewise you younger people submit yourself to your elders yes all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility be clothed with humility that is why he says now, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Rejoice in humility. Rejoice in humility. Don't rejoice in arrogance. In trials, realize that humility plays a critical component in helping the believer navigate through the life issues with ease. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, dear Father, for granting us the grace to understand the power of humility in trials and temptations that we may move into a path of freedom, understanding that the greater who is in us energizes us to overcome the aggression of the external force that can be otherwise intending to bring us down. Thank you, dear Father, for your word today. Bless this day in Jesus' name. Amen.